Welcome back to Long Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, joined here on set with Brad Micklin. I also have the Joseph Tully, David Ring via Skype. A lot to cover. Let's get started. Okay, I want to start right now with trial attorney David Ring. David, what did Jane Doe number two do so well? This was one of the biggest wins for the prosecution. That forcible rape charge can carry significant prison time. So what did they do well? What did she do well, I should ask? Well, uh, look, I think just, just sitting here listening to her, she sounds very credible. She sounds calm. She sounds like she's she's not struggling to tell her story. Uh, she comes across, as far as from what we can hear, comes across as, as very level-headed. You have to remember, this is a, a victim who reported this incident the very next day, which I think is really important. And so, hey, as we all know, credibility is everything in these types of cases, and she comes across as credible. That's, and, and we talked about that earlier when victims uh, ultimately report in relation to Jane Doe number one, who reported four days later, not hitting her upon that. However, that might be something a jury ultimately considers. Also here with criminal defense attorney Joseph Tully. Joseph, is the prosecution permitted in this new trial to tell this jury that she, that uh, Jane, excuse me, that the, that he, Helen Winslow had been convicted of forcibly raping Jane Doe number two. Is that permitted or at the very least is she just allowed to present her story? She will be allowed to present her story based on, uh, again, the California Evidence Code 1109 allows other allegations of domestic violence, rape, anything, again, violence against women in this case uh, into a new trial. But they can't say, hey, she was, uh, a, a jury convicted him of forcible rape of Jane Doe number two. They can't do that directly. However, if Mr. Winslow takes the stand and he, he testifies, then the prosecution can use his conviction against him uh, to, because it goes to his credibility. So they can use that to impeach him. So, Brad, let me ask you this. Uh, people who are new to this case might be kind of shocked to hear the different stories. What do you make of his M.O.? He's a convicted rapist now. Uh, but the question is, the different victims over this 2018, 2019 period, the different events, the different locations, the age, what do you think about that M.O.? I think a jury needs to find that he has some over-encompassing mental defect or sexual deviant conduct because all of the Jane Doe's are horrible victims as far as what they had to go through, but they're all very different. You know, yeah. two were raped, one or two were exposed, one was years, of, years ago and the other three were recent. So you have to believe that he's always had this problem and that he's just always got away with it until now. That's kind of what we're maybe seeing with the opening statements from the prosecution today and the defense. We'll hear how they characterize it as well and the differences between their first openings. Let's continue more with Jane Doe number two, such a key witness in this case. Now, David, I'm going to ask you the million dollar question that anybody who's been following this trial has asked. Since she seems so credible and the jury was ultimately able to convict him of forcible rape, when you can have a situation where the jury says, well, this so count six sodomy by use of force, well, if he raped her, now, well, yeah, sure, he must have done that too. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. They were deadlocked as to that charge. Why were they deadlocked as to that charge after finding him guilty of forcible rape? You know, surprisingly, they didn't find him guilty of that charge. And, and I find that to be a surprise because the, the, the first jury clearly found this Jane Doe to be credible and convicted him of rape. And so, you know, we don't know what went on in deliberations. There's always a possibility that uh, some jurors said, hey, he's convicted of rape. Why do we have to pile on and add on another charge here of sodomy? Or maybe the evidence just wasn't quite there to meet the technical requirements of sodomy. We don't know, but I'll say this, this is a powerful victim. This is going to pose some real problems for Kellen Winslow in this next trial. You know, Joseph, with a 10 to 2 split in favor of guilt on the, uh, uh, on the for sodomy charge, prosecution almost won that. Defense moving forward, do you think they had a conversation with their client and said, look, you're most likely this time around going to get convicted of the sodomy charge. Or did they say, hey, we have a strategy now moving forward in this new trial. We're going to work it. And we think we might be able to get a hung jury once again as to those counts, uh, as to that count. Or we might be able to find not guilty. But a 10 to 2 split, that's not great for the defense. So how do they switch it up? And what do you think they've advised their client? Well, you know, 10 to 2 isn't a great split. But on the other hand, it, it 
you know, does establish reasonable doubt. If two out of 12 people couldn't find guilty, that is goes somewhat towards reasonable doubt. And I think how they're going to approach it this time around, um, and, and attorneys don't usually consult clients on strategy. We consult our clients on facts, on you know, background supporting details that can help us, but attorneys will choose, you know, choose our own strategy. And what they'll do is they'll take the foundation of this case, they'll find out what the jury pointed to, what they put their hands on to establish reasonable doubt as to the sodomy charge, and they'll show that to the next jury. If there is testimony that said, I'm not sure about you know this or that, then uh, they'll, they, will, they will show that to the second jury and try to get the same result. Generally speaking, Brad, when you have a retrial, do you have a hung jury once again as to so many counts? Or do you see a change? Look, I know it's won and lost also with how you make your arguments, how you cross-examine, but you can have one set of jurors thinking one thing and one set of jurors thinking another thing. No two juries are identical. So is this a bigger risk with a retrial for the defense or the prosecution? I don't think it's different for either side. You never know what a jury is going to think. I think when it comes down to it, the defendant only needs to get one. So we talk about this 10 to 2 is not that great, but you know it's more than you need. You only need one. So at least the defense can say, all right, let's really focus on what it was that got us that mm -hmm. two votes, and let's highlight that, and let's highlight those across the board, because all we need is to get one. Highlight. I'm glad you mentioned that, because when we come back, we're going to play the cross-examination of Jane Doe number two, and let's see, maybe what did the defense do well here, and what would they do in a retrial? We'll be right back, right after this.